Since the beginning of the space age, mankind has developed many new technologies to help better study the universe, our galaxy, the solar system, and look for evidence of extraterrestrial life. But just a few missions ignite the imagination like Voyager 1. First launched in September of 1977, the roughly 1A blows an 800-pound space probe careered toward the outer edges of the solar system. Surpassing the distance of its sibling Voyager 2 in December of that same year, Voyager 1 was the first spacecraft to exit our heliosphere, becoming humanity's first emissary among the stars. Now it's reached into stellar space and after 46 years, the spacecraft still communicates using the deep space network. But Voyager 1 found that interstellar space is a lot weirder than we thought. In the blackness of space billions of miles from home, the most distant human-made object from Earth is behaving weirdly. It's sending nonsensical ones and zeros back to Earth. Before you ask, yes, engineers and scientists tried rebooting, but according to a NASA news release, it did not help. Obviously, it's not easy to diagnose and fix problems from 24.4 billion kilometers away. But what exactly is causing the spacecraft to transmit this mishmash of data? Is this just a small technical glitch, or the end finally be near for the iconic spacecraft? Join us as we uncover the real reason why Voyager 1 is sending a strange signal from interstellar space. The prospect of Voyager's grand tour of the outer planets emerged in 1965 from the musings of an aeronautics graduate student named Gary Flandro, then working part-time at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, the world's preeminent center for interplanetary exploration. Assigned at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to envision possible missions beyond Mars, Flandro plotted the future positions of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune with paper and pencil. He found that they would align in such a way that a spacecraft could tap the planet's orbital momentum to slingshot from one to the next, gaining enough velocity to visit all four planets within 10 or 12 years rather than the decades such a venture would require otherwise. The mission launch window would open for a matter of months in the late 1970s, then close for another 175 years. It was an ambitious idea at a time when the apex of interplanetary exploration was Mariner 4 shooting 21 grainy photos as it flew past Mars. No probe had ever functioned for anything close to a decade in space. None had the intelligence to manage complex planetary encounters at vast distances without constant human hand-holding. Playing crack the whip past multiple planets might work in theory, but had never been attempted in practice. NASA swallowed hard and proposed a grand tour mission anyway. But Congress rejected it, instead approving a cheaper, stripped-down version that would venture out no farther than Saturn. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory spacefarers responded in the tradition of the hardiest explorers of earlier epochs. They cheerfully agreed to the plan, assured one another that Congress didn't really understand the situation, and quietly went to work, designing and building two tough, smart spacecraft capable of going all the way to Neptune. Any life-limiting flaws in the probe's design were weeded out. The sun sensors in their navigation systems were boosted so they could function out where the sun gets dim. Fuel-saving techniques were developed to keep the mission viable long after it was supposed to end. We just did it and didn't talk about it, recalled William Pickering, Jet Propulsion Laboratory's director at the time. The ruse worked. As a result, in an alternate universe, NASA launched its Voyager probes in 1977 across the solar system on a very Star Trek Ian five-year mission, and at its close, 1982, the team pops the champagne and celebrates a job well done. Luckily, we live in this universe, where Voyager 1 has been trucking along for 45 years, nine times longer than the original plan. It's flown by Uranus and Neptune, and it even eventually crossed the heliopause, the point at which the sun's solar winds are stopped by the interstellar medium. 
in 2012. Fascinatingly, as of now, Voyager 1 is still alive out there, barreling into the cosmos more than 24 billion kilometers away. However, the spacecraft as well may be near the end of its scientific life. In the recent years, its weakening radio signals, reporting on the surprisingly complex plasma bubble that surrounds the sun and marks the designated boundary between the solar system and interstellar space. But a computer problem has kept the mission's loyal support team in Southern California from knowing much more about the status of one of NASA's longest lived spacecraft. The computer glitch cropped up on November 14th and it affected Voyager 1's ability to send back telemetry data, such as measurements from the craft's science instruments or basic engineering information about how the probe was doing. As a result, the team has no insight into key parameters regarding the craft's propulsion, power, or control systems. According to Suzanne Dodd, Voyager project manager at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, it would be the biggest miracle if we get it back. We certainly haven't given up. There are other things we can try, but this is by far the most serious since I've been project manager. The latest problem with Voyager 1, most likely, lies in the probe's flight data subsystem, one of three computers on the spacecraft working alongside a command and control central computer and another device overseeing attitude control and pointing. The flight data subsystem is responsible for collecting science and engineering data from the spacecraft's network of sensors and then combining the information into a single data package in binary code, a series of ones and zeros. A separate component called the Telemetry Modulation Unit actually sends the data package back to Earth through Voyager's 3.7-meter dish antenna. According to NASA, in November, the data packages transmitted by Voyager 1 manifested a repeating pattern of ones and zeros as if it were stuck. Dodd said engineers at Jet Propulsion Laboratory have spent the better part of three months trying to diagnose the cause of the problem. She said the engineering team is 99.9% .9 sure the problem originated in the flight data subsystem, which appears to be having trouble frame-syncing data. So far, the ground team believes the most likely explanation for the problem is a bit of corrupted memory in the flight data subsystem. Engineers are also considering the fact that it could be a physical hardware failure. After all, Voyager 1's mechanics have been toiling away for multiple decades. Something could have simply broken down, hardware or software-wise. In fact, scientists beamed some preemptive software patches to both of the Voyagers last year from billions of miles away. However, because of the computer hang-up, engineers lack detailed data from Voyager 1 that might lead them to the root of the issue. When it was developed five decades ago, Voyager's flight data subsystem was an innovation in computing. It was the first computer on a spacecraft to make use of volatile memory. Each Voyager spacecraft launched with two flight data subsystem computers. But Voyager 1's backup flight data subsystem failed in 1981. The only signal Voyager 1's earthbound engineers have received since November is a carrier tone, which basically tells the team the spacecraft is still alive. There's no indication of any other major problems. Changes in the carrier signal's modulation indicate Voyager 1 is receiving commands uplinked from Earth. Thus, in the next few weeks, Voyager's ground team plans to transmit commands for Voyager 1 to try to isolate where the suspected corrupted memory lies within the flight data subsystem computer. One of the ideas involves switching the computer to operate in different modes, such as the operating parameters the flight data subsystem used when Voyager 1 was flying by Jupiter and Saturn in 1979 and 1980. The hope among Voyager engineers is that the transition to different data modes might reveal what part of the flight data subsystem memory needs a correction. This is a lot more complicated than it might seem on the surface. For one thing, the data modes engineers might command Voyager 1 into haven't been used for 40 years or more. Nobody has thought about doing this with Voyager's flight data computer for decades. 
Voyager 1 and 2 have an outsized public profile compared to the resources NASA commits to keeping the spacecraft going. Fewer than a dozen people typically work on the Voyager mission. This number has slightly increased since the computer problem appeared in November, with a small Tiger team of around eight experts in flight data systems, software, and spacecraft communications assigned to help troubleshoot the glitch. Despite that, repairs can take quite a while. Imagine rummaging through a user's manual for an antique car. The book's weathered pages are probably fraying. That's not unlike what Voyager engineers, some of whom weren't alive when the mission launched are experiencing now. And in fact, this is a familiar task for Voyager engineers. In the last few years, the mission's core team at Jet Propulsion Laboratory has consulted archived documents to troubleshoot other, less serious computer problems and develop a new way to operate thrusters on both spacecraft to stave off the accumulation of residue in fuel lines. While spacecraft engineers love redundancy, they no longer have the luxury of backups on the Voyagers. That means, in any particular section of the spacecraft, a failure of a single part could bring the mission to a halt. Both spacecraft run off nuclear batteries, which produce a little less electricity each year as their plutonium power sources decay. Toward the end of the 2020s, the declining power will force NASA to start turning off instruments on each spacecraft. Most of NASA's modern missions exploring the solar system have simulators on the ground to test commands and procedures before sending them to the real spacecraft. This practice can reveal commanding errors that could put a mission at risk. Sadly, we don't have any type of simulator for this. We don't have any hardware simulator. We don't have any software simulator. There's no simulator with the flight data subsystem, no hardware where we can try it on the ground first before we send it. So it is difficult to command Voyager. That makes people more cautious, and it's a balance between getting commanding right and taking risks. In a slightly more far-fetched scenario, the team also suggests it's possible some sort of energetic particle could have smashed into the spacecraft. If that happened, it might have created what's known as a bit flip, which means a zero in the code accidentally became a one, or vice versa. Still, the team is leaving all possibilities open. That's because, in truth, it might not even be the flight data subsystem that's causing problems in the first place. This theory is just the most likely one to stem from data the engineers currently have. They said, because no engineering data is coming back, it's very hard to isolate the source of the problem. Moreover, in a bit of a non-silver lining, remember how Voyager 1's greatest achievement is being the first ever probe to venture into interstellar space, where it's surrounded by untouched stardust and blankets of darkness? Yeah, it's extremely far away from us. And that means communicating with it takes a very, very long time. Specifically, at the time of writing this article, Voyager 1 is more than 162 astronomical units away from Earth. One astronomical unit is equal to the distance between our planet and the Sun. In total, it takes approximately 45 hours to complete one back-and-forth command with this spacecraft. Thus, this process may take months. However, to give you a silver lining, though, the scientists have confirmed that Voyager 1 is exhibiting what's known as a carrier tone, which runs along a wavelength that doesn't carry information, but rather acts as a heartbeat. At the very least, we know it is alive. So if we can fix this, Voyager 1 should be able to continue its science mission. But the Voyages are already operating far, far beyond what anyone expected of them. We know the more time that goes by, the more issues are likely to arise. Otherwise, managers are also aware of Voyager 1's age. It's operating on borrowed time. So, experts don't want to spend forever deciding what they want to do. Something else might fail. The thrusters might fail. They want to do the right thing, but they can't hem and haw over what the right thing is. They need to look at things methodically and logically, make a decision, and go for it. 
When it comes time to send up more commands to try to save Voyager 1, operators at Jet Propulsion Laboratory will have to wait more than 45 hours to get a response. The spacecraft's vast distance and position in the southern sky require NASA to use the largest 70-meter antenna at a deep space network tracking site in Australia, one of the network's most in-demand antennas. Fingers crossed that Voyager 1 returns to its healthy self, but even if it doesn't, and is left alone to drift in space, we can be sure its legacy has already been firmly cemented in our books, in our hearts, and in our history. And even if Voyager 1 succumbs to its wounds, the voyage is certainly not over. Don't forget Voyager 2 is still going strong. If we can keep one spacecraft going, the mission will continue. Voyager 2, which looks an awful lot like Voyager 1, actually launched 16 days before its counterpart, on Agarulur 20, 1977. And as told, Voyager 1 just happened to get farther faster because it had a more efficient route out of the asteroid belt, officially overtaking its partner on December 15, 1977, and later becoming the first probe to exit the gravitational influence of our solar system. Voyager 2 does have a bunch of achievements under its own belt, though, such as the fact that it's still the only spacecraft to have visited the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune. Together, the Voyager's joint mission was to simply explore, to plunge through the solar system, sweep across moons and planets beyond our own, and try to go where no spacecraft has gone before. To date, the Voyagers are the only spacecraft exploring interstellar space in situ, and there are no missions that can gather this same data remotely, the team said. They've surely been doing their duty, and hopefully, Voyager 1 has a little more juice left. But even if it doesn't, scientists wish to make clear that Voyager 2 shall continue to keep the torch lit. While NASA is struggling with its iconic mission, a newly discovered quasar is a real record-breaker. Not only is it the brightest quasar ever seen, but it's also the brightest astronomical object in general ever seen. It's also powered by the hungriest and fastest-growing black hole ever seen, one that consumes the equivalent of over one sun's mass a day. The quasar, named J0529435 is located so far from Earth that its light has taken 12 billion years to reach us, meaning it is seen as it was when the 13.8 billion year old universe was just under 2 billion years old. The supermassive black hole at the heart of the quasar is estimated to be between 17 billion and 19 billion times the mass of the Sun. Each year, it eats or accretes the gas and dust equivalent to 370 solar masses. This makes this quasar so luminous that if it were placed next to the sun, it would be 500 trillion times brighter than our brilliant star. As team leader and Australian National University astronomer Christian Wolf said in a statement, we have discovered the fastest growing black hole known to date. It has a mass of 17 billion suns and eats just over a sun per day. This makes it the most luminous object in the known universe. But note that this quasar is not newly discovered. In fact, it was spotted in data over four decades ago, but was so bright that astronomers failed to identify it as a quasar. This misclassification was spotted in 2023 when astronomers realized it is, in fact, a quasar after having a look at the object's region using the 2.3-meter telescope at the Siding Spring Observatory in Australia. The new discovery that this is actually the brightest quasar ever was made when the X-Shooter spectrograph instrument on the very large telescope in the Atacama Desert region of northern Chile followed up on j 0 s 529 A piece of good news. Scientists just stated that the South Pole Telescope has a treasure map to the secrets of dark matter, ancient cosmic light that has uniformly filled the universe since around 400,000 years after the Big Bang could act like a treasure map that guides scientists to the secrets of dark matter. The Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB, 
refers to the first light to freely travel across the universe. Its journey began after space had expanded and cooled enough to allow electrons and protons to form the first atoms, meaning electrons were no longer endlessly scattering photons, and the universe instantly went from being opaque to being transparent. The CMB, or the surface of last scattering, as it is sometimes known, was picked up by a new upgraded camera dubbed SPT3G. This camera is located on the South Pole Telescope, and it was able to capture the phenomena after five years of operations with this initial data hinting at exciting future developments. As Zhao Di Pan, research lead author and a scientist with Argonne National Laboratory said in a statement, the CMB is a treasure map for cosmologists. Its minuscule variations in temperature and polarization provide a unique window into the universe's infancy. However, as any pirate will tell you, all good treasure maps need a key to read. In the case of this cosmic treasure map, the distribution of dark matter is only revealed in the light of Albert Einstein's 1915 theory of gravity, general relativity. Astronomers believe all galaxies are enveloped in massive halos of dark matter. In fact, this mysterious form of matter is so ubiquitous that it accounts for 68% of all the matter in the universe. But because dark matter isn't made of atoms comprised of electrons, protons, and neutrons, collectively known as baryons, it doesn't interact with light. Yet dark matter does have mass, and that means it interacts with gravity. This is where general relativity comes in. Einstein's theory of gravity says, all objects with mass cause a curvature in space-time, the united four-dimensional entity composed of the three dimensions of space and the one dimension of time. When light from a background source passes this curvature in space caused by mass, its path is diverted. For objects of great mass, like galaxies, background light can be curved so much that the galaxies or stars it comes from appear to have shifted in the sky. In extreme cases, light passing this intermediate object can take paths around the object that are curved to different degrees, meaning one source can sometimes even appear at multiple points in the same image. This effect is called gravitational lensing, and it is used to great effect by instruments like the James Webb Space Telescope to see faint galaxies in the early universe. A more subtle version of this effect, gravitational microlensing, can be used to determine more about the lensing object, in this case, dark matter. To get a picture of a web of dark matter across the universe, however, scientists need a light source that is equally cosmically widespread. That makes the CMB the ideal light for such an epic dark matter lensing investigation. The SPT3G was particularly able to take advantage of the lack of interference present in the South Pole Telescope's dry, stable atmosphere and remote location. In the process, the investigation added further evidential support to Einstein's general relativity. The more we learn about the distribution of dark matter, the closer we get to understanding its nature and its role in forming the universe that we live in today. Even though the new analysis is the result of just a few months of operation in 2018, the CMB lensing measurements are already competitive in this field. According to Amy Bender, research author and a physicist at Argonne, one of the really exciting parts of this study is that the result comes from what's essentially commissioning data, from when we were just beginning observations with the SPT3G, and the result is already great. We've got five more years of data that we're working on analyzing now, so this just hints at what's to come. Even using a dedicated group of computers at the Argonne Laboratory Computing Resource Center, analyzing months of data from the SPT3G camera is a painstaking job that takes years. Future results from the camera could help scientists tackle another long-standing cosmic mystery. The nature of dark energy the unknown force that drives the accelerating expansion of the universe. As Bender concluded, every time we add more data, we find more things that we don't understand. As you peel back layers of this onion, 
you learn more and more about your instrument and also about your scientific measurement of the sky. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode. Subscribe if you haven't already and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.